Do you spend hours in your head thinking about something that happened, could have happened, or might happen? Do you ask others what to do so you don't make a mistake? Welcome to the Plain It Safe podcast. I am Dr. Z, your host. I am a clinical psychologist, an author, and a person that is super passionate about sharing with you science-based skills to overcome any type of fear-based struggles. Who doesn't experience fear? Who doesn't play it safe? In this show, we will discuss how fear-based reactions happen in day-to-day life, how playing it safe behaviors look like, sound like, and feel like, how you can put into action solid tips from behavioral science to get unstuck from worries, fears, obsessions, and anxieties, and how you can start doing what works, what matters, and what you care about. Behavioral science doesn't have to be boring. Thanks for listening, and let's get started. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Playing It Safe podcast. I hope you had a good week and I hope you are ready for this episode. Today I am sharing with you the second part of my conversation with Dr. Steve Hayes. Steve is one of the co-founders of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. If you have been reading my books or you have been listening to the podcast, you know that I breathe and I live acceptance and commitment therapy skills. In this conversation, I had a chance to talk to Steve about his experience as a behavioral scientist, how he became a psychologist, how he lives behavioral science in his day-to-day life. And believe it or not, I had a chance to ask him how he keeps his ego in check. Now, think about it. If you are not familiar with Dr. Hayes' work, he's one of those people that has published over 200, 300 journal articles, has published many books, and he really has done everything he can to contribute to behavioral science. So for any person, given all the accomplishments that he has, how do they keep themselves in check? This is a special conversation because I think at the end it's a conversation about humility and how Steve keeps himself humble and how he thinks that behavioral science invites us to be humble in every single thing we do, but especially when we are looking at our belief systems. And just as a reminder, You can always send me a request for any topic or any curiosities you may have about the application of acceptance and commitment skills to any fear-based struggle like anxiety, worry, obsessions, panic, phobias, perfectionism, or procrastination. I welcome your question. If you go to the website www.com, playing it safe that zone there is a section in which you can send me a question i hope that this second part of my conversation with steve is helpful to you and gets you thinking about behavioral science (laughs) and i also hope that you get an idea of how behavioral science applies to every single area of our lives Okay, so now I am going to leave you with one of the sweetest conversations I had with Dr. Steve Hayes. Steve, here's a curiosity I have. How did you decide to become a psychologist? Well, actually, it's, it's at the core of what the ACT work is about because as a, and I did it in sophomore year in high school, I believe. So I'm what, uh, 16, 15? And I've never wavered since. So we're coming up on uh, whatever, 55 years, 57 years of that journey. Uh, I was fascinated by art, literature, stories, poems. Uh, I edited the literary magazine in college. You know, I, uh, I just was fascinated by uh, trying to get into the depth of the human heart in ways that novelists, uh, filmmakers, poets, uh, artists are able to do. I, I wasn't good at that. I was just fascinated by it and, and cared about it. The psych- I also was a, a pretty good 
pretty good in math and science and, and in the physical sciences. And I thought their precision, their progressivity, their ability to say, we know something now that we didn't know five years ago was so powerful and so important that you had to bring it into that space that Shakespeare would be dealing with. You know, that you couldn't tell whether or not a current playwright or Shakespeare was greater, but you have no trouble at all taking, you know, whether an average contemporary physicist versus a physicist 50 years ago is better. They may have been a better scientist, you know, 50 years ago, but they're not a better physicist. No, because that field uplifts you so much that just, you know, the graduate students know more than physicists from 20 years ago who were at the very best at the top of their field. And I thought, man, that's really cool. This is thinking as a undergraduate. And I said, what is a field where you could do both? I could think of only one, it was psychology. And, you know, early on, my psychological heroes are the ones who I thought kind of did both. Uh, Abraham Maslow was the first, wanted to write about peak experiences, about, you know, creating worlds that had never been, you know, that really, I thought, that's awesome. You know, I, I, I didn't want to deal with mental illness, particularly. I wanted to deal with me mental prosperity. Mm -hmm. My own struggles with anxiety made me more interested with mental disorders. But at the time, early on, it was that. And then I became a Skinnerian because I read Walden too. And Walden too, just I thought was so fascinating that maybe you could completely reorganize childcare, you know, you know, family life, you know, how you fix your meals, you know, where you keep your clothes. Maybe you could do all of that inside principles that were as tight as we knew how to create in behavioral science that came right out of the animal learning lab from rats to Walden too. So you're looking at a, a crazy hippie guy who thought bottom up tight science might give us a way forward with the highest level aspirations of my generation and of me as a person interested in human prosperity and, uh, you know, the positive uh, peak experiences that all, you only get occasionally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Steve, in that process, did you have any mentors? I did, you know, I was lucky enough. Of course, I've mentioned it too in the sense of Maslow and Skinner, but, uh, and, and I never met Maslow, but I did spend a lot of time with Skinner. Um, oh yes, oh yes, many conversations. Oh, I'm that old. <laughs> I'm that old. In fact, all of the behavior therapy heroes, you know, Joe Volpe and all of those people, and the behavior analysis heroes, Don Baer, Mont Wolf, Todd Risley, all of those folks, many, many, many hours spent. I ask you a little bit. So, how was hanging out with a Skinner? I think when we think about a Skinner, we think about this very uptight guy, a behaviorist, but he was a very revolutionary guy for his time. Wasn't oh my goodness. You know, he was, he was uh, such an iconoclast, such, you know, very creative, very interesting person. Uh, you know, I knew him only as an old man, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and I could feel he, when he would talk to you, sometimes he would say, just like I did, these long rants, you get old, you do it more. Yeah. And, <laughs> and some of them I would recognize were whole pages out of his book. You know, they would sometimes you would click into a zone where it's almost word for word. I knew what he was going to say because I already read it and memorized it. <laughs> I was a real Skinner scholar. I, I, I read almost everything he ever wrote and uh, internalized it. And, you know, thought, boy, that's just so awesome. But uh, it's also more to be learned. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. The people of that era, that first generation, not just Fred, that's what people called him, was not Burris, not just Fred, but Fred Keller. Oh my God, what a sweet man. His, his uh, fellow graduate student and then really wrote the first book on behavior analysis, Keller and Schoenfeld. Well, Nat Schoenfeld, who was my mentor's 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 mentor. Oh, wow. um, uh, so I can trace myself back through that uh, in the two ways that I I trace my lineage um, and on and on, you know, these early folks, when you think about behaviorists, you think, oh man, they're so tight. Let me give you a couple examples. Ralph Hefferlein, a card carrying behavior analyst, a rat running behavior analyst at Columbia, wrote the first Gestalt therapy book with Fritz Perls and Paul Goodman. Ralph Hefferlein. Wow. A rat lab guy. 
Amazing. Could you think of anything farther away? No, Gestalt is right inside this tradition. People look at Act and they say, well, it kind of looks like Gestalt. Well, duh. <laughs> it's three branches off the same tree. And Ralph wanted to call it integrative therapy mm -hmm. because he thought it integrated this contextualistic, radically functional behavioral strand, which most people doesn't know exists in behaviorism, and this um, a humanistic strand that exists inside Gestalt. That, that moved away from analytic because he was an analyst. So was Paul Goodman, a psychoanalyst, but moved more in the humanistic direction. That combination, he, he thought it should be called that, but Noah Fritz thought classic Wertheimer was coming back and it should be called Gestalt therapy. Think about how it would be if we thought of Gestalt therapy as this mix, as finding a way to square the circle of humanism and behaviorism. Mm -hmm. People don't know that Skinner won the American Humanistic uh, Society Award. Wow, that's amazing. He was a major humanist and viewed by us by humanists as a humanist in a funny way. Wow. You listen to you know Carl Rogers and B.F. Skinner, there's a deep respect there. This is not a disrespectful conversation. So on and on it goes. The you know, Don Bear was on the the board, Don Bear, you know, the early father of behavior analysis, was on the board of uh, EST training. Oh, wow. He was an EST person. Wow. Yeah, he was on the board when, when uh, Werner uh, Earhart was still running it before he sold it to Landmark. Wow. And on and on, on it, it, it goes. You know, the, uh, the early, early uh, schedules of reinforcement work with... Uh, uh, with uh, uh, Skinner, uh, you know, the, the, the co-author of that book uh, was in anal psychoanalysis for six years every day. <laughs> you know, so back in the day, behaviorists were interested, this rats and Walden two wing, mm -hmm of the depth of human experience in every way possible. And yes, they wanted to use tight, basic principles to understand that. You go two or three generations out, there's a wing that became very conservative, you know, and it's really what happens when in religious groups and things like that, where founders are very flexible, they often mystics, and next thing you know, the followers are having religious wars over dogma. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens in psychology. Yeah. Can I ask you a little bit about that? I think that there is still, even in 2020, this bad rap to behavioral therapy. I think people don't realize that the behavioral therapy is actually very humanistic, very sensitive, that it's all about understanding our drivers. But you see that their founders were flexible and they're expanding. And at some point, there is this shift. If we hold yeah. on to our thing as that thing, how does it happen? Historically, we have seen this in religion, yes. in different types of belief systems. What's yes. your take on that? I think that it comes from rule governance, from the dominant of verbal rules over our experience, which is the core of the problem, this evolutionary recent adaptation that we're doing right now with symbolic learning, which is only mm, two, 300,000 to mm, 2.83 million years old. We know that because the language trained chimps don't do what your 12 month old baby does that leads to human language. That's another story to tell. You know, we, the ACT journey started with the excesses of rule governance and how to dismantle it. Once we develop RFT, the, the basic science that's underneath ACT, we can actually use it to help establish language functions when they're not there. Now creating the problem that ACT will solve. That's actually the case. You can show, you can take, you know, children with severe developmental disabilities, use RFT to develop their language functions so much that they begin to develop mental health problems <laughs> that they didn't even know how to develop. And then you have to treat it with that. But uh, when you leave behind a legacy of rules, you're inviting people to do what restricts your behavior. Okay, so what we've done in, in the ACT community, deliberately, thoughtfully, on purpose, is we've tried to diminish hierarchy and rule governance in the society itself. And so we, we don't allow people to certify therapists. We don't 
create a lot of hierarchy. You were careful about not, you know, saying things like, oh, Steve Hayes is the developer of ACT. Mm -hmm. Very bad idea. No gurus. That's a principle. No gurus. They all had clay feet. I saw that happen in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't need to tell that story. But all these heroes, even the Zen masters, turned out, next thing you know, they're bang, trying to figure out how to, you know, you know, get in the pants of their acolytes. I mean, it's just a train wreck. As soon as you put people up there and say they're great, 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 grand, you know, their rules become, their words become, it's not safe. No, you apply it. So science will help you with the rules, yes, in terms of these principles, but community and connection and experience and actually testing it in the bottom line outcomes for individuals, including the people who are part of it. I mean, the divorce rate among psychologists is worse than among people who aren't a psychologist. I know, it's super. Hello? It's who the hell? Smells on a, on a, a pedestal. So my answer to your question is, I think it happens because of rules. I think the solution is, mm -hmm. Take these processes that we know diminish the dominance of rule governance. We, we actually can have rules about rules, right? Mm -hmm. We can have strategies. Like you could have rules about how to create a good painter, but if painting, if, but if you paint by rules, it will not be good paintings, right? Like I could tell you how to do theater exercises that would help you be a better actor or actress. But if you try to do actor be an actor and actress by following the rules you'll be horrible so you can have rules about experience mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah. you know how, how to hit a baseball how to dance how to love how to be more psychologically flexible but being more psychological flexible isn't following the rules the rules are about how to create experiences that help you get out of the domination of rules yeah. does that make sense Except where it's useful in some areas like values and so forth, rules have a role. But coming back to it, we've now set up, I think, I'm being a little prideful, but in the ACBS, the Contextual Behavioral Science world, we've tried to set up groups that are open and controlled by the group around a set of values and processes that are in the psychological flexibility model, but other things will come in, you know, the importance of compassion, for example, from the compassion folks therapy people or the importance of relationship from the fat people inside this community. The people listening don't know what I'm talking about. There's a whole collection of people, not just ACT people, who are part of the organization that are trying to develop ACT. And we we try to do what we say, not just uh, say what others should do. We try to apply those principles to create a group process that's open, accepting, non-judgmental, values-based, focused on community and connection consciously to create you know patterns of doing things running our workshops running our conventions and little things are like follies making fun of our, each other why because it reduces hierarchy well why would you do that because it reduces the domination of rules and those who are the anointed rule givers heck bring them down Knock, knock them off their stool, put them on the same ground as you. So I think we've done some good work at, and, and most of the science and clinical traditions out there, I think have not been thoughtful enough about this. Mm -hmm. No one, and, and you, you don't need people to be like keepers of the book. No, the book will be changed and rewritten, all those things. So let's, I'm sorry for the long rant again, but it's a really good question. What is coming to me is that we have seen this. At some point, we hold with white knights to those rules. And I love your response. Let's just step back and let's create rules about the experience because it really creates a counter movement. And certainly within the contextual behavioral science world, you see it. There is yeah. no hierarchy. Now, if I can extrapolate that to the current time that we're living, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but one of the things that has been very aggravating to me is this polarization of messages between good and bad. Suddenly, if you're a scientist, that's a bad thing because that means you're against religion. And once again, 
were living this polarized time in which we're holding on to rules, what's good, yes. what's bad. So how can we relate and apply what you just said? How would that look like in regard to this polarized world, polarized time that we're living? I think it could be, I think we could do a lot if we're careful, if it isn't sort of like, oh, you know, everybody ought to be following act principles or something in, in a crude way. Um, part of the core of the act business, it starts with this philosophy of science that is aontological, that, that takes language to be a tool that helps us accomplish goals, and that doesn't then say when you're able to accomplish your goals, is the reason it did is that it's really true with capital T letters. No, we evolved to survive inside the one world, but we can't even trust our own perception. You know, we may be living in something more like the matrix. When we do models of this, by the way, there's a book by Donald Hoffman called The Case Against Reality that I rather like, where, you know, if you model whether or not you'd want sensory systems that would show you what's really true, or would you want sensory systems that could wander from the truth but help make things easier, the, la the latter always wins. So you don't do machine code when you're dealing with your computer. You have a, a graphical interface. And files are little square things that sit on a screen and you can drag them into these little trash can things or map. And the files are blue and the pictures are green. And the, no, they're not. The file's not blue. It's not square. There's no trash can. That's, but, but that helps you do the, use the computer. Well, in the same way, when we break up our experience, when we talk, when we experience, when we do, et cetera, we're just breaking up the one world to get things done. And that's great. Now, with an average person, I'm not going to go into these principles, but I do a little bit in a liberated mind because it helps us then hold lightly. You know, hold these principles lightly. You know, pursue your values passionately, but hold them lightly. You know, pers you know use these principles, but hold them lightly. Allow them to, to change. Allow, find places where they're not true. Find other ways of speaking that are even better. And when you do that, if you come, come back to the kind of social part of it, you take something like uh, the fact that now around the world, the world is becoming so interconnected. COVID really shows it, doesn't it? You can't be disconnected from the world. You know, we're heading to a world of interconnected everything all the time, everywhere. And, and it does have challenges of fake news and discomfort and who are we anyway? And okay. So let's come back and take the time to listen to others, for example, to take their point of view, to hold your own thoughts lightly, and the flip on the, on the right side, right? So, uh, you know, it turns out, take something like religion and science. You know, my colleague, David Sloan Wilson, has written a very good book that on scientific grounds shows that without religion, we may not be here as a civilization. I mean, you just look at how we made it through the pandemics. Who survived? It was the people in religious groups. Why? Because they were, the ministers were out there caring for the sick. You know, and a lot of folks were just putting their, their family members who weren't even dead yet out on the street corner to be picked up and carried away. That actually literally happened. That literally happened. But some of those folks made it through the Black Death. And so you don't have to, you know, when you understand and watch this, then there's a certain humility that it brings. Don't be so arrogant about your ideas, your principles, your theories, your words. You're just talking. And yes, bet it by science. No, don't then put it into capital T truth. And I think we can come up with a more humble form of behavioral science that can allow us to bring the best ideas that are out there in human culture. I really appreciate your response. I love what you're saying. It's about holding ourselves, our thoughts slightly. Now, can I ask something personal? Mm -hmm. Of course. Steve, you have been part of an incredible movement in behavioral science. You have written hundreds of papers and books and you're launching your classes. You're leaving this amazing footprint. 
how do you check that you are not jumping into the ego part? We are humans and we get socially reinforced. <laughs> how do you handle that? I, you know, what I've done, the best thing I've ever done is my last two marriages, I've had three, are to, well, even the first in her own way, are to very strong women. Mm-hmm. And I can guarantee you, if I come back from a, a conference or a workshop and my head is a little bigger and my hat doesn't fit on my head, within a few minutes, my wife will correct that. <laughs> Really, it's literally true. And I, I went, oh, what a sweet person she is. She's so kind to me. She's kind to me in ways that you would look at and say, well, that's not very kind. No, it is kind because it is not good for me to climb inside some clown suit of achievement and pretense and all of that. It's just not good for me. And it's not good for my work. And it's not good for others. And I came here to do something. I came here to do something about human suffering. So... You know, I know it's actually a problem. I, I see it more with my pontificating and holding forth. You even see it on this. Some of it's just the forgivable thing, what happens to old people. But um, uh, yeah, it's it's a practice. It's a uh, mindfulness practice. And I've been, it isn't really my wife doing it to me. I mean, it's creating a context in which socially it's not supported by the people I love, by my children, by my close colleagues, you know, I invite them in. And the one thing that my wife says that I I do feel proud about, she said it just last night. She said, you know, the one thing that people don't really know about you is that what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just trying to be me. And so that when it, when I climb inside that clown suit, I have a little bit of a feeling that something's off. Mm-hmm. And I'm supported by my, by those who love me to uh, put my feet on the ground and take a breath, show up and, and get back. You know, those books. Yeah. I, I go to my Google scholar page and look at my citations. I do, but I also, use that to find out how I can support people who are connecting with the work. And so uh, I try to keep the ego in check and to keep the work as the focus. Uh, And, uh, you know, eventually that'll pass away. I'm 72. I don't know more years I got. And I'm not going to leave something behind that will people will remember by my name. That's not what's going to happen. I hope I can leave behind a community or, or an approach that will echo forward And even the name of that community will be forgotten, but the work won't be forgotten because it gets put into the culture. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that you're sharing with us how you find these moments of humility. I think science needs that. For science to be disseminated, we have to continue questioning and we have to be humble. The moment that we call into, I have the truth, that's the challenge, that blocks science. That blocks growth, right? I agree. And, and you see the pushback against science in our culture right now, in part because I think there's a whole wing of folks who've been made to feel stupid or be talked down to. There's a real truth in there, but there's an arrogant elite voice in our culture that needs to be softened and needs to be do a lot more listening to you know, blue collar workers who have not done the college education, etc. You know, that it's not all about the PhDs and their, you know, uh, their uh, house in Palo Alto. It, 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 it's not just about this cutting edge technological world that we're creating. So, yeah. Uh, take down science down a peg in terms of its arrogance, but then lift it up a peg in terms of its possible contribution to human well-being. Because we're running out of time, here's a very silly question. 
Of course, I could be asking you so many questions. I love the conversation. Thank you for the opportunity. You've created a really nice context. Steve, if you were to have a cup of coffee today with any person you want, who will that person be and why? You know, I've thought about that uh, before. I would, I would like to talk to Charles Darwin a bit about, uh, you know, evolutionary theory and the potential uh, that it has for human well-being. I would like to understand a bit more about how he saw things. And I would like to share with him some ideas and see what he thinks about it. I'd like to have a conversation, a genuine conversation uh, with, with Charles Darwin, who I think it has not yet landed in human culture. Mm -hmm. It's landed in the life sciences. Nothing in biology makes sense without evolutionary theory, but it hasn't landed yet in cultural evolution. It hasn't landed in the individual evolution of human lives. It hasn't landed in the evolution of successful businesses and churches. And, and it has says so much about how, who we are and how we can be in a way that creates progress. We can evolve on purpose. I really believe we can. I believe the story of evolution is the story of the evolution of consciousness and purpose. And that that combination of consciousness and purpose uh, is something that we can best harness by using the queen theory of the life sciences, which is evolutionary theory. So I'd, I'd kind of like to talk to a really, really important person. He wasn't the only one. There were others who's had very similar ideas, but he, he's a pretty important one. It'd be, a, it'd be great to be able to have that conversation. I would love for you to maybe consider that that's your next book, Evolving in Purpose. <laughs> Thank you so much again. It has been such a pleasure and I'm super grateful for having shared this moment with you. Thank you. Thank you for such interesting questions and for just uh, being there with me and walking through the answers. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, I will very much appreciate it if you will subscribe and share this podcast with your friends. And if you're feeling extra generous, I welcome a review on Apple Podcasts. Show notes of this episode are in the website playingitsafe.com. Make sure to subscribe to my newsletter so you can receive more tips to stop all types of unworkable playing it safe actions. See you soon!